three and a half years old. I had just arrived from Laredo, Texas to North California. And that's my dad's old black Plymouth. And I remember one of my older brothers told me to stick my tongue out, so I did. And what I do when the going gets a little rough, I come back in this room and look at that picture and I say, everything's gonna be all right. You see a picture here, a picture, of course, of the great Machito, the great band leader, and Mario Bauza, the trumpet player in the band and musical director. And also, Mario Bauza was married to Machito's sister, Gracelia Gracie, over here. And Mario Bauza introduced Chano Pozo to Dizzy Gillespie in the very early 40s, and that's when Latin jazz was basically born in this country. see here in the picture of Tito here with his band when they had their 20th anniversary. A lot of great guys in his band here and the great uh, Santito Colon's right next door to Tito there, great singer. And uh, Tito played a great important part in the growth of Latin music in New York City and then of course later on Latin jazz. Here's a picture of Tito Rodriguez and his band. And you can see here people like Victor Paz on trumpet, Mike Collazo on drums and bongos and whatnot. And of course the great Cachao on bass. Here's a great shot of the great Mongo Santa Maria, who of course came out of the Tito Puente Orchestra out of New York City by way of Havana, Cuba. And of course, Mongo Santa Maria plays a very important part in the growth of Latin jazz and also uh, is my hero in life, the great Mongo Santa Maria. My main man. Are you guys ready for some great Latin jazz? Yeah. All right, folks, let's hear it for the Grammy Award winning Poncho Sanchez and his Latin jazz band. Right here where this little strip mall is, right here, the back of this little strip mall where we're at, 
This used to be my house. I remember this post. I used to go into my home, this right through in here. My house was right here. I grew up right here in the One Ways. I was here before the, it was even called the One Ways. My house was right here. This is my old neighborhood where I was first exposed to Latin music. Our house was knocked down to put this little strip mall here. And there was a lot of family activity in that home. I was the youngest of 11 brothers and sisters. This is my all time best friend in the world right here. We walked That's Ralph Vasquez. He's my number one partner and all time best friend in the world. Ralphie. Hey. He and I used to walk to kindergarten together. Hey! I'm your best friend, man. And then everybody goes, everybody goes there. <laughs> yeah, we good, we good, we good. Ralph, hold that low. Ralph formed a band called The Halos. My first gig was as a lead vocalist. We're into the music. Here we are in this old picture. That's Ralph on lead guitar. And here you see a skinny Poncho Sanchez playing the tambourine. Roy Chevrilla playing alto saxophone. Art Rodriguez, better known as Dodo, playing drums. And Philip Ramirez on rhythm guitar. And Mike Dominguez on bass. Here's Mike right here. The Halos. Boy, we had some fun in those days. I used to pretend I was James Brown. Yeah. He was the front man, and, and uh, there was a time where he we came up to me and he goes, for a long time, Ralph, didn't we? the yeah, people out there think it's my band, you know? <laughs> I go, I don't care, collect the money, Brett. Get the money. You know, said, uh, but, uh, you know Ralph shows up one day and he says, I got Ponches back from Texas. And I said, yeah. he's going to be in the band. And I said, what the heck do you want to do? Yeah. Well, let's get him on guitar. We already had five guitars. So I said, well, you know, we need. he can't play the guitar that well. <laughs> well, okay, then we'll have him sing. And then after that, he started singing and screaming, and, and the girls just went crazy. It hey, was great. It was I like that part. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it sure was. But eventually, we went our own separate ways. We had different musical taste. They wanted to play Rolling Stones and Beatles, and I was into soul music, James Brown, and Latin jazz. We all know that Poncho was very dedicated to his music, and, and he was very sincere and, and about his music, and so he just kept on plugging and plugging, whereas us, we had other interests in work and so forth, family, and Poncho just kept on hammering out the style that he loved. I love the early Latin music that my brothers and sisters used to play on the old record player. I used to hear the sound of the conga, bongos, timbales, and vibes when they would put on the Cal Jada records, Tito Puente, Tito Rodriguez, Mongo Santa Maria, and they would dance all night. And I used to go to sleep with the rhythm of their dancing and the music. I just loved the sound and the way it felt. That was the only thing we knew and the only thing we loved, you know, yeah. music was really our only real distraction, you know, what we were... You know, my parents were always, uh, you know, working, and uh, mom was working at home, of course. My dad was always such a hard worker providing for his family. And, um, you know, we didn't have a heck of a lot of spending money or anything, but we did spend whatever little money we had on records, records. you know, oh, albums. Yeah. Well, we yeah. would bring all the albums you know? home when we'd go see all these groups perform at the Palladium. We'd go out and buy we the would, album, yeah, and we'd play them opinion, over and over and over. And, of course, there was Poncho just... Taking it all in. Taking it, exactly. all in. Taking it all in. I remember how you studied that Cal Jader album. Remember the one with the with the bull ring? Yeah, I remember. I had two congas the same size that my father and I bought in a pawn shop. So I tuned one high and one low. So I got my brothers and sisters old records and started listening to the sound of the conga drum and tried to play along with it. I played congas out in my mother's garage from sunup to sundown. And that's how I taught myself to play. We used to listen to him, and my mother said, oh, he's just out there practicing his music out in the garage and making a lot of noise. And so, you know, she, we didn't realize how good he was <laughs> until he started getting a little bit older. Actually, Gracie was the first one to notice that I was doing something more than just hitting the congas in the garage. Gracie came over to me one day and said, you know, you're starting to sound pretty good in there. Yeah, there was this uh, a local musician here in L.A., and we used to go to the pasta house often, mm -hmm. and that was like the cool place to go. Okay. And yeah, so we, we used to listen to Willie Bobo, and um, Eddie Cano also played there, and this guy, Ray Medina. So anyway, one day I'm thinking, I have this young brother at home that really messes around with the congas. 
you know, I, I just want to know if he's doing, if he's got anything going, if he's doing it right or what, you know. Okay, so I asked this guy. I said, would you come over to my house, you know. I said, you know, look at his work, listen to him, whatever. And if anything, you know what, my mom makes a hell of a great lunch. You know, if nothing else, you'll have an awesome lunch, we'll okay. Every yeah. day. So anyway, he says, yeah, sure, I'll go down there and I'll listen to him. So he did me the favor and he came down to the house and Poncho was in the garage out there and he was playing you know messing around so they went back there right poncho yeah and then uh he's well let me see what you got son you know let me see you play so i, I so put on one put a record on and play it and i had a record player and i put on my favorite cal jader song and i started playing and i played and he's just watching me you know and the song was over and i took the needle off the record player and there was silence for a while i thought uh-oh <laughs> maybe i didn't do too good and this guy's gonna let me have it right and he told me Hey, how did you do that thing with your left hand? And, and hey, how did you do that little thing? With, he started asking me questions. And I said, well, what are you talking about? You mean this little? And I, he started asking me about a couple little moves I made. He goes, man, you sound good, man. He goes, how long have you been playing? About six, seven years? I go, six or seven years? <laughs> you know, about six weeks, you know? Those albums were his teachers. I mean, he got so deep into the albums that I don't think anybody else on this planet got so deep into those albums to come out with what he came out with. I mean, he, he became a master drummer from those albums. Isn't that incredible? Nobody teaching him. He just kind of listened to the albums and picked out the minute details from there. The solos, uh, the way the tempos, uh, the, the harmonies, the melodies, the rhythms. He learned all that from the album. So when he finally met Cal, it was like one of the most incredible experiences for him because he was so deep into it. Uh, that when he finally got a chance to sit in with Kel, uh, he mentioned that he was so, so nervous, so nervous. And Kel said, well, what songs do you know? And, and Poncho basically told him, I know them all. So Cal Jader was certainly one of the, uh, if not the catalyst for Poncho Sanchez, because he represented uh, a lot of things. Uh, he was one of the people who really popularized Latin jazz and even was one of the uh, original innovators of Latin jazz in the 1950s, because he started as a jazz musician. And then when he heard Tito Puente and Machito and Tito Rodriguez, you know, he went crazy and he just went all Latin jazz. He was actually a, a Swedish American from Missouri, you know. So he went back to uh, the Bay Area in California where he was from, and he would put groups together, but he would be playing in places like New York, and all over the country. So he's really one of the people that, uh, that really started bringing Latin jazz into what you might say it's evolved state, you know, uh, not just the Dizzy Gillespie channel post thing, but actually Latin jazz where they were doing chachas and mambos, but adapted to sort of a jazz uh, framework. And here's Cal Jader, the greatest Anglo musician in Latin music, talking to me about my drumming. And the first thing he told me is, he says, you know, um, Ernie's here, he says, you sound like a young Mongo Santa Maria. And, other people have told me about you that you play really good congas. Man, he didn't need to say that. I, just, I got more nervous when he said that. I said, oh, well, thank you, you know? He goes, hey, you want to sit in? <laughs> sit in? You mean, I told him, tonight? He goes, yeah, tonight. He says, you know what, I'll call you up from the crowd. I said, okay. And I went in, I paid to get in and all that, all three of us, right? And then I, my, my, one of my best friends, Candy Martinez, Rebecca Martinez is, is the band manager today. That's, these are friends from way back, Candy told me, Poncho, are you really gonna play tonight with Cal Jader? I said, I guess that's what he said. <laughs> so we're sitting there watching them play, you know, perform. And sure enough, man, about halfway through the set, he goes, hey, we're gonna have a little guest come sit in. And uh, his name is Poncho Sanchez. He's gonna play a little conga drums with us. I sat in with Cal Jader and uh, he called me a couple of weeks later and uh, hired me to play with the band for one week. I played New Year's Eve with him in 1975, and this is the first album that I ever recorded with Cal Jader, live at the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, 1976. Cal was able to put Poncho into the national jazz arena, and that's tough. No doubt about it, Cal Jader gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. And whenever I can, I still get together with my brothers from the Cal Jader band. 
Let's do another two here. What is it, Raj? What are we gonna do? Uh, later. Later, that's right. Hans just brought a whole new perspective, a whole new push. You know, he brought life back to Cal, because I think Cal was sort of kind of ebbing a little bit. I always remember that great sound that Rob has on the, on the bass, a big sound, you know? And um, so after, the, after that first gig, I just, I told Kelly, yeah, man, that guy plays great, man. So yeah, I think we're gonna use him, you know, on some more stuff. Uh, him being in the band uh, seven years. We were on the road together seven years. And me and Rob used to do all the band setups and everything. We, were, we got paid for being band boys too. Right. Band boy by daytime and solos by night. <laughs> It was just exhilarating because I was now in a group that, that was a working group, a Bay Area group that toured, and they were very hard to come by in the, the Bay Area. So I felt really, you know, kind of lucky. And um, also I knew that it was going to be good because Poncho uh, was really good, and I think it stimulated Cal. I'd like to introduce the guys in the band. Poncho Sanchez is back on conga drums with us. Our bass player is Rob Fisher. Rob. I remember the night I drove all the way down to Santa Cruz to a job and... And Vince Ladiano is on drums. Vince. So I show up uh, with Cal. I didn't know what to expect and there was Poncho. Poncho met us at the airport and I mean, that's the first time I laid eyes on him and he... Uh, he seemed to be the most um, they had the, the beard and the, uh, uh, in, no, the most, the hair in the back with a braid and the, he was wearing a cap. And right away I knew that he was the, he was sort of the linchpin of the group. Okay, you know, this guy, and he was very, uh, focused really focused about the music and most concerned about, for instance, me, the bass chair, whether I was in a cut or not. We set up the instruments and then he talked to me about some of the breaks and things, you know, what to expect. And uh, it was obvious he was, uh, he was very articulate. I was not auditioning for Cal. I was auditioning for, for Ponch too, more so for Ponch. We actually sat down and played the gig and then I saw how, how well he played, and uh, it was, it was, initially it was, it was quite a, quite an experience. When he gave me the, kind of the high sign, I felt really good. When we worked with Cal, I mean, that was magic, number one. We, we all knew where we were going, what everybody was doing, and it just worked. You know, Cal, Cal would, he, when he could do a record, he would just, I remember he would just tell us maybe about a week or two before uh, some of the ideas he had. And he would say, I want to do this as a bolero, I want to do this as that, or a samba or whatever. And so we'd have just a general idea going in there, but we didn't rehearse or nothing, you know what I mean?
Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> Playing with Cal Jader for me was like a dream come true. And really, uh, to be honest with you, man, uh, when Cal Jader died, I didn't want to play with anybody else. I just wanted to be in the Cal Jader band. It depressed him tremendously. He went into a deep, deep depression. First of all, uh, uh, the trauma he went through of being in the Philippines, and all of a sudden, you know, his father, his musical father dies right there on tour, and all the musicians are going like, what can we do? Cal just died. I mean, we're here in the Philippines. We can barely communicate with people, and, and here Cal passes away. So he went through an incredible experience dealing with that, you know? I wasn't ready to let him go, but it ain't up to us. It's up to the Lord, you know? He chooses the time when you go. And I wasn't ready for that, and I couldn't believe it, you know? But it happened, and I just had to find a way to, to bring myself together. And I started putting this band together more and more. And our first record was Sonando on the Conquer Picante record label. And it turned out very well. What really surprised Poncho is that often Cal Jader, in conversations with Poncho Sanchez, would always tell him, oh, but look, when you get your band, uh, look out for this, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. And Poncho would sit there going like, what, what are you talking about, you know? And he always referred to like, when you get your band together, you know? Cal already saw, him, saw the leadership quality that Poncho had. And Poncho goes, he knew it before I did. I had no idea I was going to become a band leader, you know, but he kept saying when you become a band leader. So he, uh, Cal put that seed in his mind. I guess he saw the potential and, and Poncho way back then. And he's proven, he's proven Cal right. This is it right here. It's back over there, right where that lady's walking. That's the entrance, and down here was the uh, office, and I was in there a lot. <laughs> the kids, there's the kids. And then, there's my phone, and that's the. Get the phone, babe. Yeah. That's the old house. Can mm -hmm. you picture your camera now, babe? The St. Peter's mm -hmm. Church. Look at this, Laredo Muffler shop. And right there, that guy right there. That's an old conga drummer. <laughs> so old retired conga drummer in Laredo, Texas. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun when you start to think that uh, uh, you know Poncho Sanchez, uh, an American of Mexican ancestry, born in Laredo, Texas, um, could actually you know be such a prolific figure in Latin jazz. hits the conga drums, he has a way of expressing himself with his hands hitting the skin, and it's something very unique and special. Tito Puente had that on the timbales, you know, the vibraphone. Dizzy Gillespie had that on the trumpet. Chopin had that on the piano, you know. So it's just something so special, it's just not ordinary, you know. And that's what people, I think, hear, and that's what makes them great. It's exciting. That's the word that Tito Puente used to use. When you bring these elements together, these fantastic, you know, Afro-Cuban rhythms and throw these jazz harmonies on them and, and make an arrangement that just punches at the right spot because you're a good arranger and, and then you're a good musician, you know how to play it right, with the right feel, the right rhythm, you know, you really know what you're doing. It's exciting.
99% of the time it's a sellout. I mean, tonight we're this close to a sellout and it's Academy Award night, so that'll tell you, you know, they'll come out and see Poncho rather than sit and watch the Academy Awards. Mr. Terrence Love, give it up. Welcome to Steamers, everyone. You guys ready for some Latin jazz? All right, folks, let's hear it for the Grammy Award winning Poncho Sanchez and his Latin jazz band. Puente and Celia Cruz, mm -hmm. all these names. I mean, that, that was like the ultimate, okay? To, to know that our brother, Poncho, shares the stage with these people and, and uh, you know, has gone on to do all these beautiful things and this great music. I mean, it, it's just incredible. He doesn't want to sell out. That's the making of any great artist. Anybody who looks like Fidel Castro and can still make it in the music industry is definitely not sold out. Poncho's beard, his little ponytail, even told me, he says, I'm not going to wear some little tie because some producer wants me to. He says, I'm, I'm going to go out there with my guayabera and my acoustic instruments and we're going to play music. And, uh, and they can take it or leave it, you know. And I can take or leave an article that was written about me in Jazz Times Magazine a couple of years ago. The cover said I was the new king of Latin jazz. I never really looked at it that way myself, me being the new king of Latin jazz. I never pictured myself being the king of anything, you know. I just love my music and I love to play. I love my band. I like the style of music we play. Poncho was very uncomfortable with it. He didn't like that. When he first saw that, he was like, oh, are they calling me that? You know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not the king of Latin jazz, you know? Uh, but he had no power over that. That was something that the editor wanted to do, other people wanted to do. So he, he had nothing to do with that. They, they, they did it on their own. So when I wrote the article, right, actually, I didn't title it, you know, because I really didn't know what to call it. And so my editor, or the publisher, really, uh, Lee Mergner, you know, at the time, it was, it was a couple of years ago, and there was a big slump in, you know, in the magazine sales. So he really wanted to find a headline that was going to grab people's attention. So he called him, you know, the new king of Latin jazz. And when that went out, you know, it was like there was a lot of people that said, hey, right on. It's about time that Poncho got the recognition that he deserves. But on the other hand, you know, there were a lot of people that felt like, you know, well, wait a minute, how can you call him the new king of Latin jazz? You know, Tito Puente has just passed away. You know, this is sacrilegious, you know, you can't do that. I don't think there's gonna be the same kind of king as Tito, uh, you know, or there's not gonna be the same kind of uh, genius or leader or father figure like we had like Machito, or there will never be another Celia Cruz, you know. However, we will have new leaders and new kings. And I think that right now, in my opinion, if you look at what people like Tito Puente and Machito believed in, you would have to say that Poncho Sanchez, in my estimation, for the amount of recording that he's done, for the amount of traveling and, and performance he's doing, which is probably more than any other Latin artist in his area, 
What I mean is Latin jazz. He's probably the one performing more in that area than anybody in the world. Well, he's basically filled the shoes of what Tito was doing because Tito was the one who was playing that music more than anybody, uh, uh, you know, around the world and taking it uh, sort of as a keeper of the flame all over the world and preaching the word of, of this great music and inspiring people. And that's what's so beautiful about this music. It's so transcultural. Uh, I've seen, you know, this music in Japan. I've seen it in South America, uh, in Europe. You know, it's all over the place. In Africa, it's very popular. It's almost like it's gone back to its uh, origin. And so, um, in my estimation, uh, Poncho Sanchez is a new king. Yeah. You know, for many years, there was a lot of uh, stereotypes and biases that people would say, and particularly, you know, coming from the Santana, you know, kind of mold, was that, you know, that Mexicans can't play congas, that Mexicans can't play Caribbean music. And he was a guy that was proving folks wrong. But it was interesting to see, you know, some of our Puerto Rican brothers and sisters, you know, Cubano brothers and sisters, who would say, hey, it no longer matters. The drum speaks from the person who is playing it, who has learned it in the proper way, and that understands, you know, the powers of the drum. And so I felt that what it did was that it kind of created the controversy that got us to a place, particularly as Chicanos and Mexicanos, where people began to realize that we were legitimate contributors to the city of known as Latin jazz. Mexicanos have been great contributors to jazz dating back to the late 1800s in New Orleans. In fact, if you want to know some interesting history, there's a theory that even regular jazz has a Latin tinge. John Storm Roberts has done a lot of research in this area, and he's got a book called Latin Jazz, where he speculates on this uh, idea. There were actually a lot of Mexican musicians in New Orleans in the 1870s, more or less. They came with a Mexican cavalry band, and it was a fantastic group that uh, the people in Louisiana got all excited about at the State Fair because they were so good. And they performed a variety of Mexican canciones, Mexican songs, but also a lot of Cuban habaneras, danzas. So the theory is that a lot of the early jazz musicians uh, were influenced by these musicians because so many of them, or a good number of them, stayed in New Orleans and took on jobs and actually became sort of some of the teachers of the early uh, African-American uh, uh, innovators of, of very early jazz that started to surface by the turn of the century. Well, a lot of the um, jazz musicians heard this music, and two of the things that, that came out of Mexican music were three over four syncopation, and that appears in a whole lot of the pre-jazz music and a lot of the, the jazz music, a lot of the ragtime music that precedes jazz by about 20 years. I've heard that Jelly Roll Morton was directly influenced by that band. You know, so I, I, there's a lot of truth to it. I mean, what can you say? You know, that you have to also, the same people, the, the same slaves that came here went to Cuba. So not only did the Mexican band influence jazz in New Orleans, but the Africans influenced the Mexicans and the Cubans. Music comes from Africa. All of the creative understandings of life are created by human beings that original roots come from Africa. So please, um, if you don't put Africa first, you're not understanding the very basic of our humanness. Um, that's one of the issues, one of the problems. Humanity has a tendency to forget its root. Um, the African, uh, Cuban, Latin, influence on music as a whole across the planet has been forever. It's been since the origins of humankind. I mean, the first rhythms that you heard were from Africa. And so African rhythms, which are the basic root of Latin rhythm, uh, mezclado or mixed with Cuban rhythms, uh, then interpreted, conceived and interpreted by the human animal who's been here on this hemisphere for 40,000 years. And you I wonder why Ken Burns failed to mention this stuff in his jazz series. I don't think Ken Burns really tried to exclude anybody. I just think that he was uh, undernourished and he didn't have the full nourishment of uh, 
conceptual understanding. Um, you know, when you put jazz uh, in the African perspective and you don't include the rhythm, what do you got? You know, where does rhythm come from? And what's the basic influence of, of jazz and Latin music? Eddie, my man, those are some good questions. But I'm feeling a little undernourished myself right now. So what do you say we go have some good food at my place? Thank you, Poncho. I want to show you what I got in this pot. This is the real deal over here. This is New Mexico green chili, and it's got meat, potatoes, and red hot chili from Hatch, New Mexico. So this is what you call the real deal here. And over here, we have rice, arroz, Mexican rice, Spanish rice. I made everything myself personally for you. All right. Sabor, a usar. Scotty and Francisco too. Serafino. Sal, Scott, Francisco are all members of the Poncho Sanchez band. They are incredible musicians that deserve to be recognized. Francisco Torres plays trombone, great arranger, and great soloist. Serafina Aguilar plays trumpet and flugelhorn, powerful, strong lead player. Scott Martin plays tenor saxophone, alto saxophone, and flute, and baritone saxophone, and also a great arranger. Javier Vegara plays tenor saxophone, alto saxophone, and flute. George Ortiz on timbales. Georgie also plays timbales, congas, bongos, all percussion instruments. Tony Banda on bass and vocals, helps me with the vocals. Sal Vasquez plays the Cuban Thresh guitar, the regular guitar. Mataz, check it is. And I taught that young boy how to play when he was in junior high, just a kid. David Torres is our musical director on piano. And David is like my right arm. Two, David helps me with all the arrangements. One, two, three, four. And helps me run the band. And last but not least, Larry Sanchez, who's my sound technician and roadie in the band. Larry's been with me about 15 years, knows my sound, my style. I'm not gonna do any gig without Larry. <laughs> Larry not here yet, but I'm sure he'll be here shortly. All right, let's go. Let's go on in there. Gentlemen, this way. Let me lock this car up. There you go, we can always come back in too. So, just kind of getting it together here, you know. I tape up before every show. But I gotta tell you the story. When we played at Carnegie Hall, I invited the great Mongo Santa Maria to come and watch the show. He wasn't gonna play. He, we just invited guests to come and hang out with us that night at Carnegie Hall in New York City. And they brought Mongo to the, my dressing room. And when I seen Mongo, he sat down and we started talking as I was taping up my hands. And so I was taping up my hands and I seen Mongo staring at me, tape my hands. And I told Mongo, I seen him staring at me. And I said, Mongo, do you remember when I used to watch you tape your hands? And, and 
And he says, uh, yeah. And I says, isn't it funny? Now you're watching me tape my hands. And he looked at me and he had a little gleam in his eye. And I thought I would just ask him, Mongo, do you want to play tonight with us? And he told me, he looked at me and said, with that gleam in his eye while I'm taping up, he said, Pues si tu quieres, Poncho, if you want me to, I will. And I told him, you're going to leave it up to me? <laughs> I said, of course I want you to. And he goes, OK. And he started taping his hands right away, just as fast as he could. He started taping up his hands. He didn't skip a beat. He started taping his hands just as fast as he could. And I, man, it was incredible. I was taping my hands, and the master was taping his hands. And next thing I know, Mongo, he got a standing ovation when he walked out. He got a standing ovation when he soloed. And when he finished playing, they gave him stand, three standing ovations, man. And that's the great Mongo Santa Maria. And that's my hero, man. He is filling the shoes of, of the others who have passed on. But he also has articulated, like Tito did, and others, Machito, that they wanted to get involved in teaching and to help young people continue the tradition. Not just preserve it, but to continue innovating, to continue renovating, renewing the music, you know. The Latin jazz style. This music is not just supposed to be there frozen in time. You're supposed to make it new and add things and be creative. So I think that he will take those roles in the industry. I think he will get more recognition uh, with time as being uh, not only the musical leader, but sort of the uh, social leader of this movement. I think he's already getting that kind of credit. His growth has been incredible. Um, and, and he continues to, to, to come up with the, the basics and then mixes them together with uh, exactly where he's feeling in his moments of understanding at the precise moment he's playing. Uh, he's constantly in, in progress. See! Aha! It's Friday night, so we're listening to the program Jazz on the Latin Side. And we do this every single Friday night, 7 to 11 p.m., playing jazz to the beat of the conga drum. Another thing that we are very, very excited about is that Aponcho Sanchez has a brand new CD, and it's called Out of Sight. He continues to evolve in the sense that he wants to look for different directions and bring together uh, roots uh, that he picked up when he was a kid, uh, roots uh, that are very uh, deep into the R&B sounds and also roots that are very deep into the Latin sounds, and now he's able to mix both worlds, and he's doing it uh, with a lot of fun and I think very efficiently. Uh, here's a little example of that. This one a tune called Hitch It to the Horse uh, where he sings with Sam Moore and uh, Billy Preston is playing the B3 Hammond organ. Poncho Sanchez, hey, he's having fun. <laughs> Side is probably the most diverse record that he's ever made in his career because it's got R&B, you know, it's got some of the greats in R&B, you know, like Billy Preston as well as the great Ray Charles. You know, it still goes back to, you know, the great Latin jazz sound of Poncho Sanchez with several numbers and the great cats that he's got in the band today. You know, and then he still goes back to, you know, that, that salsa Latin jazz sound, you know, and giving us so many Palmieri tunes that we can dance to. And it's one of those records that really, it's great from start to finish. You put it on, man, and you just let it roll, and it carries you into, an, into a space that, that really does liven up your life. Got 
to high Well, this is uh, one of my all-time favorites, James Brown tunes, Out of Sight. We're doing this Latin style as a cha-cha, funky cha-cha, with a conga, bongos, and timbales, bell. We're gonna make this a funky cha-cha, soul music. He really is a funky cha cha. <laughs> he is he is truly uh, the epitome of what that really generates in people. A funky cha cha player. The guy is uh, cha 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 as soulful as it can get, and he's creating his own world. And in that world, it's a mixture of uh, you know rhythm and blues and and uh, cha cha cha. <laughs> I just sing and play for my soul and for my heart, and uh, and that's how I do. Cuban again or Chinese? Okay. Huh? Yeah, buddy, the food's coming. <laughs> you know, chicken, beef, and noodles and everything. Tony like general chicken. Now that's it. Okay. So, what's going on here? He's a Latin jazz messenger in the world, and what he does here. Uh, in town is the same thing he does in Japan when he goes there, in South America, Africa, everywhere in the world where he plays. He leaves a huge seed for people to continue to appreciate the music. I don't know, let's try it. Let's see what happens. There's another side to Poncho that I think has also been very important, is that he's, he's so human, he's so real. You know, he's not somebody that has, you know, a star factor that he follows and that a certain, you know, personality that he has to put on, you know, and he has to have bodyguards around him. He's a real guy, you know, and I think that that's one of the things that a lot of us have come to respect about him is that he's been able to, you know, move up, you know, in the music world, but he's always stayed grounded to his roots, remembering where he came from. I think Pancho definitely is keeper of the flame. He really reveres his forefathers in music, and especially the conga players, and uh, he definitely is keeper of the flame. There's Francisco. Hey, Francisco! There's some people in there waiting. And you know what that means? I got, I got to do it. How'd you wipe the kids, man? Watch out, don't get hit by this guy here. He wanted his money back, he's leaving.
There it is right there. Golden Oldies Records. I was in there yesterday. Got a bunch of old records in there. See what's going on with David Torres, number one man. We gotta talk to David Torres and get a set together. I walk by and they just throw a boom and hit me with a, some dust and <laughs> say, you're done. Poncho in the early years, and they said, well, Poncho means Frank, so let's put Frank. I said, well, well, that's really not my name, though. Well, but it sounds cool, put Frank. So they put Frank on the card, and then something a couple of years later put Poncho, which is still not right. My name is Poncho. <laughs> Get your newspaper in the morning, man. <laughs> 